Sir Midrin then decides to leave the place using magic assuming that it will only continue to get worse from here if they waste more time in this place. Raynell wishes them to have a safe trip back, and the wounded young man thanks Raynell for all the help she has done for him till now. Raynell shows her appreciation saying that he should take better care of his wounds and continue to live a healthy life from here on. As soon as both of them vanish in thin air emitting a bright light, Rynell realizes that this is the teleportation magic that she keeps on hearing about, and no matter how many times she sees magic, she is never getting used to something like this, ever. Soon enough, Namiel holds a brand new robe ahead of her, and when she asks him about it, Namiel adds that she managed to put dirt on the previous one while saving the young man, so he had to gather another for her. She apologizes to the man assuming that she must be frustrating him at this point, but he only takes it normally as she had done the right thing at that moment. He adds that even if she didn't do something, Namuel himself would have gotten into it anyways in the end, which feels like a relief to Raynell. As she looks back into her memories, she thinks that the young slave who was beaten by his master had an extravagant appearance in the original version, unlike his current condition of something similar to a slave. Assuming that he is someone important, Raynell thinks that Sir Midrin would have done something herself, and she feels better knowing that she will never go on to regret her decision to save him. Knowing that it's better to save someone rather than caring for the original story, she hopes that the man will be happier after this. Suddenly, her daydream shatters like thin glasses as soon as Namuel reminds her that they still have to go shopping for the prince. On the other hand, the treatment on the young man has been finished, and it is being done under the guidance of Sir Midrin. As soon as he gets up and asks what he should be doing right now, Sir Midrin asks him to relax for a while as many things have happened to him throughout the whole day. Just when Sir Midrin claims that she will be staying on the other side of his house so he can visit and is about to leave, he calls her from behind, only to remind her that he is a slave, so there is no way he will be given so many things as she is giving him. But Sir Midrin knows that he has the fire in him that can reach him into places further into heaven. She only advises him to follow along with what she will be teaching him. She also mentions that it is never about to be easy, so he should be preparing himself for what is going to come. When Sir Midrin notices that the guy cannot even express his own feelings over someone else's, she assumes that he has a lot to learn. Assuming that meeting Raynell will brighten his mood, she uses the excuse to motivate him so he gets better with the path ahead of him. He instantly claims that he will do whatever is needed, and Sir Midrin leaves saying that she has to take care of a sick person sitting at home. As the room is empty, the young man reaches to the windows, wondering when he will ever be able to meet Raynell once again. On the other hand, Raynell is having a hard time choosing something for Carmute, and even though there are a lot of options, she isn't sure which one will be right for him. Namuel thinks it is better to just leave and come back later, and the shops will be closing soon enough, and just as Raynell is sighing on her own, she notices a shopkeeper behind her. She instantly runs up to him and points towards some threads, saying that she will be purchasing them. Even though she knows that it is rather small of a gift for Carmute, she hopes of making something with the threads on her own to make it more special. Meanwhile, Carmute is planning for the banquet ceremony and hopes to invite as many people as possible and thinks of fixing an adequate budget for it. Suddenly, Nadia calls for him saying that Lady Raynell is looking for him, and as he looks at the time, he feels like she might have been waiting for him until leaving for bed. But Nadia mentions that Raynell wanted to give him something, which is the main reason, and she adds that she will be meeting him in the garden. As he begins calling her out in the garden, suddenly, one rose petal falls over his head, only to see that hundreds of them are hovering above his head. The crow version of Raynell is above his head range, and she instantly transforms into her human self and comes down on the ground asking for his hand. Raynell then asks Carmute for his hand, and he immediately realizes that she has brought some kind of gift for him. He extends his left hand without even thinking, while she continues to ask him to hold still for a moment, and the whole time she tries to fit it in his hand as he keeps his eyes closed. He couldn't help but wonder what kind of gift would get Raynell this focus to make him wear it, and she then adds that the work is finally done. As he holds his hand closer to his face, he notices that she made a lucky bracelet herself. Knowing that they cannot spend much time together these days for both of their tasks, she made it for him. She feels as if the bracelet will at least take care of his feelings, even for a little bit. Even though she thinks that it is too simple to be a gift for him, Carmute adds that it is not that simple. He then embraces her, 
adding that there is no way someone would be able to find something better than this even if they searched the whole kingdom. He feels like he will be able to endure any kind of hardships or lonely moments and hopes to treasure it with his whole life. But she adds that he wouldn't have to risk his life for something like this, wondering if she could give him something similar to this beforehand if it would mean so much to him in the first place. As Carmute looks around the place, he realizes that it is already late, so it is better for her to go to sleep and rest for a while. When she asks him about his situation, he adds that he still has some unfinished work, so he might have to go to sleep later. Even though she assumes that it will be fine if he waits until the next day, he thinks it will create more barriers for him if he decides to wait. Assuming that he is right, she calls him for a second as she sits down in front of the stairs, asking him to lie down for five minutes on her lap. After being mesmerized by her loving self, he decides to give in saying that he would love to make the whole day a national holiday just for that. Raynell is rather surprised and asks if he is allowed to do something like that, adding that he could definitely do it as he is the emperor so he can do anything he wants at this point. When she brings up the topic of history in this conversation, he claims that he couldn't care less about being remembered by the people as it doesn't really matter to him. As she begins to caress his hair, she feels like she can have moments like this forever to herself. Then the next day, Raynell begins attending the class to her tutor like the other days, and she is busy fixing her posture while adding a book's weight on her head. As she thinks about the lessons more deeply, she feels like there is no end to all the etiquette lessons, making her wonder how long she can take it. In the middle of it, when she begins to lose her consciousness into some higher being, the tutor calls out to her screaming. Raynell realizes that she is having a tough time coping with it and managed to transform into her bird self. Even the tutor claims that there is no way she should be doing something like this, even though the lessons are rather difficult for her to cope with since if she lacks knowledge, her life in the palace will be problematic, which is rather unthinkable. When Raynell thinks of it deeply, she reminds herself how she has been a human the whole time and couldn't cope with the life in the forest, so she managed to come to the palace in the first place. Transforming into her human self, she promises to the tutor that she will try her best to overcome all the challenges, and she is happy to see that her student is trying to grow her willpower for Carmute. Realizing that it is rather hard to change her habits only with lessons, she expresses her feelings to the tutor, which then makes her wonder how much time she actually spends as a crow in a whole day. The way she looks into her day, she realizes that she might be spending almost half a day in her transformed state. After hearing this, the Countess remarks that they might need to fix her entire daily routine at first, and since there is no need to worry about budgets with the Emperor, she might only need to help her to learn the demeanors to be in the palace. Soon enough, many of the maids come in ahead of them, and it seems that they will be the ones who will help her with all the practices so she can become comfortable being a noble from now on. When Raynell thinks of Nadia as she has a contract with her, the Countess adds that there is no need to worry as Nadia will be the one who will be leading the maids. Happily, Nadia comes in expressing her gratitude saying that she has already been promoted and now she can help her better than ever. Raynell hugs her maid in happiness and congratulates her on her growth, but that only gets the Countess mad as they still need to change her behavior. Then instantly, the tutor brings up the dress made by her, assuming that it is better to start with a nightgown since the nobles are mostly judged by the things that they wear in the first place. But knowing that the clothes she is wearing right now are totally made out of her feathers, she feels like she will turn into a plucked bird if she manages to wear something noble-ish which is a matter to worry about. Knowing the fact that she already has to deal with the fact that everyone thinks of her as an ominous bird, but looking plucked as well will make it harder for her to cope. Even if everyone else's mockery wasn't enough, she thinks that Carmute will be rather frustrated seeing her like that, and she starts to scream wondering about the consequences. Raynell sits down on the ground begging and adding that she will do something else, rather than this, and she is even ready to accept the fact that she can study all night. Just when she explains what the issue is in here, the Countess wonders if she might have made a mistake in this situation. Realizing that she has made some kind of mistake by bringing the proposition, the Countess then holds Raynell's hands, adding that she will bring Lady Murden here to give them some kind of counsel in their favor so in that way Raynell will be comfortable. But as Raynell wonders what might happen once Murden comes into the palace, as she would love to experiment with her body, she worries that she might even lose all her hair in the first place. 
Assuming that it will be rather bashful, Raynell gets into changing her clothes this once and gets into her noble-ish clothing in a mere minute. As soon as she gets out of the dressing room, Nadia is barely holding onto her mouth as she is rather speechless. Soon enough, Lady Midran asks her to transform into the clothing despite all the nervousness. As soon as she transforms into her bird self, she plops down on the ground which gets the Countess rather disappointed, as if she believed in the theory given by Raynell in the first place. Then Midrin realizes that the same thing that happens when Carmu decides to transform is happening in this state as well. The clothing that he wears doesn't affect his transformation in the first place, and after gathering all this information, she thinks of getting Namuel on the work to research these things once again. Then when Raynell realizes that her clothing stays well, and the same being transformed into a human, Midrin claims that the previous ones managed to disappear, meaning that those were only created for her temporarily and the new one took its place. Knowing that they are safer than ever after this experiment, the Countess elaborates that Raynell will be able to wear multiple dresses in the banquet and decides to order to put the dressmakers in work already. After this investigation, Raynell is rather happy to feel normal like the others and knows that she will be able to wear expensive stuff like the other nobles as she has been wondering how to use the gemstones that Carmute managed to give her ages ago. Accepting her fault, Raynell holds the Countess's hand as she didn't think of trying the idea out before rejecting it in the first place because of her scared self. Raynell makes a promise saying that she will take everything that she taught her into account and get better at dealing with her own insecurities. But instead of dwelling into her real feelings, the Countess berates Raynell, saying that the nobles do not hold hands to let the others know their gratitude or say the truth in their own way. Raynell lets go of her hands and lets her know that it is out of habit, and the Countess remarks that she made her own mistakes as well since she didn't think of her unique condition in the first place, so she is to be blamed at the same time. She even adds that Raynell is familiarizing with people faster than ever, all while learning the important lessons much better than other people, so she shouldn't be the one to lower herself like this anymore. The Countess remarks that humility is nothing but a virtue, but Raynell is not someone ordinary, but she is the Emperor's partner, so she should learn to carry that pride with her as well. Later at night, when Raynell lies down on her bed, she reminds herself of how the Countess should have scolded her in the first place for not acting like an adult, but managed to encourage her later on. She remembers how she has been spending her time in this world, trying to save herself from danger to survive, and the life around her was always unpredictable. But then soon enough, she received so much help from many people around her which makes her feel like she is finally becoming a part of this world. She realizes that this might be the reason why even after sleeping alone in a corner of the palace in a chilly place, she never felt like she was lonely. Then at the day of the banquet, the maids call for Raynell, saying that she will have to be ready for the ceremony on time. Raynell understands the importance of her actions, while Nadia takes care of everything from her hair to the accessories. As the hallway of the palace is filled with the noblemen dancing with their women, some men in expensive clothing are waiting to meet both the emperor and the empress in person. The young man with ginger hair adds that his partner wouldn't have to wait for long to see the empress as she still didn't get married to the emperor, so she will have to enter before him. The knightly men assume that they must be the one to keep her safe for now, since the newly created nobles faction are still targeting Raynell's position, so it is safe to say that there will definitely be those like Llewellyn who will try to blend themselves into this event as well. So, there is no way they will be lacking in their job, as they have the utmost urgency to protect Miss Raynell in the Emperor's palace, no matter what happens. Soon, Raynell comes out of the place wearing her expensive gown holding a golden fan in her hands, introducing herself to the public and welcoming them to this banquet ceremony. Just when the crowd begins to gather around her like bee swarms, Sir Winster extends his hand toward her to guide her through the crowd while introducing himself. While he is blabbering all the appreciation with his mouth, she is unable to wonder what to reply to that, just like a noble should have replied in the first place. Soon enough, the partner manages to use his magic to conceal their voices and Raynell feels like she is way better now, assuming that nobody can hear them, so she doesn't have to change her voice all the time to keep her demeanor safe. Even so, the countess in the crowd is still looking at her like a hawk, and the noblemen around her continue to motivate her, adding that she has done really well. Soon the trumpets begin to call out for the entrance of the emperor, and as he holds on to the side of the stairs of the palace, he thanks everyone who has gathered ahead of them to let him know his hospitality. 
As soon as the dance begins, Raynell wonders how she managed to see something like this, which she has only seen in movies or games. Soon enough, Ferris de View Kodisra, the first prince of the Ferris kingdom comes in, asking for her hand for a dance. When she is having a conversation in her mind, wondering what to do, Karmut comes in saying that the lady has a prior engagement. He then holds her hand in front of him to have a kiss, all while asking her for a dance which she instantly agrees to. While dancing with the Emperor, she feels like the real life makes much more sense, and she couldn't have thought of having the same experience in any way in other form. The slow sense of unity and beautify continues to caress her body, and she feels better than ever. As the dance is over, the Emperor offers her wine, and he praises her for being a total noble as she is acting like one. But since they are alone, Karmute adds that she doesn't have to be that formal around her, adding that she shines the brightest when she is acting like herself. Assuring himself, she claims that as soon as nobody is looking, she will quickly go into her normal self in a single heartbeat and notices that the Countess is still glancing at her from the crowd. Soon enough, Sir Midrin comes in praising them both, and when Carmute asks how she is enjoying, she adds that she only prefers to watch over them which makes it more exciting. Just like that, she introduces the same young man who was once saved by Raynell, and he is looking as elegant as ever, introducing himself as Miel. Emperor asks Lady Midrin how the young man will be of assistance to him, and with the wish of her, Miel shows the power of three superior spirits which shocks even the crowd. Even the Emperor is not able to believe the sight ahead of him, and realizes that when the time comes and Bolpelos returns, Miel will be a great help in the battle. Emperor gets introduced to Miel, adding that he will grant him the title of a count, and Miel elaborates his gratitude to Raynell since she was the one who rescued him. Then instead of serving his loyalty to the Emperor, Miel does it to Raynell, which shocks the heck out of her almost instantly.